Maybe sound. Um, so, um, yeah, so I went um, back and forth a little bit on what to uh, talk about today. Um, and I ended up uh, settling on um, this project, which um, builds on uh, some work um, I did a couple of years ago now, and um, which uh, I have sort of interim results um, among other things to share with you today. And I thought that this would be a good group to present to, because I think you may have some uh, useful comments. Let's just do me one second. There we are. So I thought I could uh, start with a historical event that occurred, I think it was 1,977, I think, uh, years ago this month, in the Ides of March. <laughs> Um, so this is um, Julius Caesar being assassinated in the Senate. I'm not completely sure this is actual footage, but um, it's a depiction, let's say. And um, not, uh, well, fingers crossed my Latin is um, good and I've chosen the right verb here, um, but I think it'd be reasonable to um, posit that a Roman of the period might have said something along the lines of Brutus Caesarem Confodit, Brutus stabbed Caesar. Um, but as many of you will know, um, other word orders were available. Uh, here are a couple of them, Caesarem Brutus Confodit, Confodit Brutus Caesarem. And while these uh, different sentences might differ in terms of the emphasis put on different constituents, um, in terms of the information structure, there was, not a big problem in identifying who it was who did the stabbing and who it was who got stabbed. And that's, of course, is because we have these uh, case endings on the nouns in Latin, um, the M on Caesar, the Us on Brutus. If <coughs> Brutus had been the object, it would be Brutum, and we keep all that kind of stuff clear. Um, in English, of course, we don't have um, case endings like that on nouns. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have to uh, make use of word order um, to indicate who did the stabbing and who got stabbed. And um, we keep that clear in the sense like this, Brutus uh, stabbed Caesar and we're fairly, um, we're fairly restricted here in the kind of word orders we use in English. And it's long been observed that there seems to be a kind of a trade-off um, in uh, word orders. Um, so I'm just trying to sort of, no. So it seems to be a kind of a trade-off in word orders uh, typologically across the world's languages, such that languages with more fixed constituent order, like English, tend to have less case. Languages with more case, um, like Latin, Russian, uh, tend to have rather more uh, flexibility in word orders. And for those of you who like that kind of thing, we can make a kind of evolutionary analogy. Um, and Mark Aronoff has, uh, has used this um, uh, this kind of analogy in the context of morphology before, for instance. So we can think of um, ecological niches. So for example, here we have these yellow birds eating bugs off uh, this tree and off the grass here. And uh, we uh, <coughs> might perhaps get a new population moving in. So we have this competition now between these red birds and these yellow birds. And we can think of different things that might happen. So we think of one of these types of birds as being like word order, one being like case. We think the analogy will perhaps one um, prospers, <coughs> one <coughs> takes over the niche, you know, um, while the other disappears. So we might have a language where we have fixed word order um, occupying this um, linguistic niche uh, while case um, gets eliminated. Or we might find um, perhaps that the two different um, um, uh, linguistic uh, components of two different populations um, find different issues to occupy. So here we have, for example, the yellow birds have got the foliage, the grass and so on, and the red birds take the bar. Now, you may or may not like this um, analogy. I think it's sort of fun, but I don't know how, how useful it necessarily is. But we can approach this question in a slightly different way and think about, well, what are people doing? Where, what are the kind of individual level um, trade-offs that might uh, feed ultimately into this larger scale trade-off? So I think we can think about this in terms of um, things like effort and uncertainty. 
So etymorphology, like case marking, um, costs to some extent a certain amount of effort um, to use, and people on the whole like to try to save effort. On the other hand, uncertainty in communication is a problem. We kind of want to know who, it, who did what to whom, who did the stabbing, who got stabbed in these important events like that. So we need to find a solution to these different pressures. And there are different ways we could approach this. So we could um, Tea Park and City went order relatively fixed, but not use case very much, save effort by not using case and have to City went order do the work for us. We could um, take advantage of the flexibility that, that variable constituent order gives us. So we could vary our constituent order to convey different types of emphasis. And we could use case to um, indicate who did what to whom. And we can get kind of strategic about this. So we don't, we're not stuck with necessarily using case all the time. We could condition case on something. For example, we might mark objects only under certain syntactic circumstances. Or we might condition case on animacy. Um, in Russian, for instance, um, animate, uh, so, um, in Russian masculine um, nouns where it is perhaps less obvious in context, who is the object, who is the subject, um, mark object case only when they're animate. And there's been um, some experimental work on this using miniature artificial language learning, um, in particular by um, Marcia Fizikina and colleagues, um, which has supported um, a lot of um, what's on this page. A lot. So they found um, results which are very, very much in line with um, this account, manipulating things like effort, the kind of uh, mini uncertainty available um, that's there in the language. So these are experiments across where people learn an artificial language and then they produce sentences in it. And we sort of want to think that, in other words, what's happening when this kind of thing, this kind of uh, trade-off gets into language and ultimately into typology, is it's happening when people are using language, learning and using language, where um, it's in the arena of use, if you like, to um, quote someone from Edinburgh. Um, but we have to bear in mind, right, that people are not just using language in a vacuum, in real life at least. So people tend to care about the social structures they belong to. They tend to care about the identity they project when they use language, the indexicality of the forms that they use. Um, and this presumably is going to influence how they behave. So I'll give you an example um, re relevant to case in English. We might think of the form whom, um, so I think it's reasonable to say that we no longer need the form whom in English to distinguish whom does what to who. Um, we, uh, in fact, it doesn't really do that very reliably for us. We can swap it around with who, we can leave it out, we can, and it doesn't really seem to make much difference. And it's been argued, I think, pretty convincing that really what whom is doing in English is not indicating thematic roles, but indicating that the speaker is the sort of person whom likes to use the form who, whom. And I'll leave you to decide what uh, the kind of indexicality that a form like whom um, might have. So a way of looking at this in the context of what we talked about before is perhaps social meaning here has created a kind of alternative social um, niche um, for um, a form like this, which is maybe semantically um, redundant. Mathically redundant might be a, perhaps a better way to put it. It's acquired, while it's redundant in certain respects, it's got this um, social role to play. So this question um, prompted uh, Marsha, Marsha Fitzgerald, who I've mentioned before, and me to um, conduct an experiment um, a few years ago. And I'll start by talking about this, and I'll talk into, about some more um, recent work following on from this. So I'd like you to imagine that you are participants in this experiment and you're on a trading mission to a distant planet and you need to learn the language of the aliens that live on this planet. Now the aliens on this planet come in uh, two varieties. There are blue aliens and there are orange aliens and they speak a language in which there is case marking 
at least for the blue aliens. The blue aliens will always mark object case, morphologically, by placing a marker after the noun. And the orange aliens never mark case. So a couple of um, clarifying points. First of all, we didn't tell the participants this. This was there in the data that they were exposed to, but we didn't actually talk about case at all in the instructions. We just told them to do these two species of alien. But um, there was this language and the aliens might differ in some ways. Also, we uh, counterbalance the colors. So for your purposes, think blue aliens case, but for the actual participants, um, it might have been the orange aliens who used the case, the blue, blue aliens who didn't. But for your purposes, think of the um, blue aliens as being the ones who um, used case. So the language which participants were exposed to and asked to learn for this trading mission um, consisted of six nouns and four verbs, plus a case marker. So there were six animate individuals who um, the language was the aliens like to refer to. And there were four verbs, things that, referring to things that the four different actions that the individuals might do to each other. See them there. And the grammar of the language was fairly straightforward. Always in the data, always reliably subject, object, verb, SOV, word order. So the word order, in other words, left no doubt as to who um, was doing what to whom. The blue aliens, however, had this case marker, which appeared after the noun, when the noun was the object. 100% object case marker. 100% reliable. So this case marker, if you like, um, could be seen as redundant in the case of the blue aliens. The orange aliens never used this case marker, but there was no doubt about who was doing what to whom in the language because of the word order. So overall, participants were supposed to a language with 100% reliable SOV word order, and half the time, reliably, uh, with the blue aliens, they would see a case marker as well. So the training worked like this. Participants were exposed to the nouns um, and tested on them. They were then exposed to some sentences where you see videos and were encouraged to repeat the sentences out loud. Then they would see uh, um, some a comprehension test. They'd see a sentence. They'd see two videos with the rules um, flipped. In the videos, they choose the one that went um, best. Then they'd see some sentences again. They'd see another comprehension test. And finally, they get a production test where they were given a video to describe using the alien language they'd just learned. Now, for all of the training, but not the production test, participants would see an alien in the video along with the um, sentence. So they see it just in the corner of the video, the picture of an alien. The idea was the alien was the one who was given the sentence. So um, I'll give you an example of what the sentence exposure looked like. So you'd see um, a video like this, oh. where um, for in this case, uh, you see that you have an orange alien who is saying the sentence. Barsa, Kuvta, Tegu. So in reality, they'd see the, um, they'd hear the sentence along with the video. I brought it up to break things down for the purpose of this talk. Um, and it would go with this video. And as you can see here, this is an orange alien. There's no case marking. The blue aliens, on the other hand, would mark case. You'd see a video and hear a sentence. Barsa, Kufta, D, Tegu. And here you have D, this object case marker, appearing after the object noun. So that's basically what participants saw. And they would finally then come to um, uh, um, production tests where they had to produce sentences in response to videos without these aliens present. So we manipulated the instructions we gave to participants. In one condition, we bias participants towards the aliens who are using case. So we said, for example, we are especially keen to trade with the blue aliens. They seem to be on our side. They have important resources. We try to impress these blue aliens in particular. We also had a no case bias condition where we did the same thing with the other aliens who were not using case. And we had a no bias condition where we didn't specify the color of the aliens. We said, we're keen to trade with the aliens. They seem to be on our side and they have important resources. We should try to impress them. That's the control condition. So 
So just to be clear, just a reminder where you say blue aliens, we mean the case using aliens, where you see orange, we mean the case non-case non using aliens, um, but we use the colors of the instructions. No reference was actually made to case in the instructions of this experiment. And this was an iterated learning experiment. Um, I probably don't have to explain what an iterated learning experiment is to um, any of you, um, but just in case, there's some extra people here. The idea was that um, participants were supposed to a language, they would produce sentences, and the sentences they produced would form data for the next um, generation of participants. And the chain structure worked like this. So this is like the initial setup where participants the participants be exposed to, case using aliens, no case aliens. We'd have two participants in each generation of each chain um, who'd be exposed to this. And then their output would form the blue dialect for the next generation. And we kept the orange dialect um, consistent. We wanted to have this um, constant dialect where there's no case. Um, so we'd have this um, uh, comparison and so on. And we went up to five generations if case disappeared from the language entirely, so if we had our participants simply didn't use case at all, then we stopped, we didn't gather data for the following generations, even if we hadn't got five yet, because what we were interested in was whether case would survive. And case was not going to find its way back in if it had disappeared from the language. And there were uh, 10 chains in each of those uh, three conditions. So what did we find? How long, in other words, did the case markers survive in the language? Now, bear in mind that, um, first of all, that case was redundant in this language, as I've discussed. Word order was doing the job of indicating who did what to whom. And it also costs a certain amount of effort to use participants have to click an extra button to add a case marker. So in the no case bias and the no bias condition, we found that case disappeared very rapidly, as we have to expect it. And I think this is not terribly surprising. Um, even for the by the um, second generation, in fact, definitely about the third case had pretty much disappeared. So what happened when we bias participants socially towards case? Um, well, in that case, we actually found the case did decline in use, but a lot more slowly, and it remained in the language for a lot longer. So in other words, this social bias or might perhaps have created kind of a social niche for case to occupy and remain in the language, rather like whom um, in English. Now, you might well be wondering, well, okay, but in biasing participants towards the blue aliens, we're also drawing their attention towards the blue aliens. And perhaps this is, the content of bias doesn't really matter. Perhaps this is just a matter of drawing attention towards one group of alien or another, um, causing them to attend more during the training to that uh, particular species of alien producing the effect we saw. Is the bias really social? So to get that, we conducted um, a further condition called the against case condition, where we drew participants' attention to the blue aliens again, case use aliens, but this time we did so in a negative way. We said, we're especially reluctant to trade with the blue aliens. We don't think we can trust them. They have no important resources. We should be very, we should be very wary of these blue aliens in particular. So in other words, Attend to these blue aliens. You don't want to impress them. We should be careful of them. Um, so if the content of the bias isn't important here, if what matters is simply that we're drawing attention to these aliens, we should expect the results of this condition to look like the case bias condition. If on the other hand, the content matters, we should expect this to look like the other conditions. So what do we find? This is what you've seen before. And what we found with the against case condition is it's just like these other conditions. It's not like the case bias conditions. The content of the bias seems to have mattered. Um, this behaves just like the conditions where we encouraged um, participants, we biased participants towards case, or we didn't induce a bias at all. So in conclusion, and you can read about this 2018 paper, um, Case markers were lost in all conditions, or they declined in all conditions. And this is not terribly surprising because they are redundant, they're effortful to use, at least to a smaller extent. But social pressures modulated this trend. And the case markers are much slower to be dropped if they're playing this social role. And this can't be explained by simply, in simply in terms of drawing greater attention to the aliens who are using case. 
Okay, so this is nice. And if you think about this experiment, a way of thinking about it might be that, well, we're enriching the language in a sense. We're giving word order is always do, also already doing a job and we're creating this role for case. So we get to keep both and we now have a language which is doing a couple of different things. Once if you like, we can use case for one thing, um, word order for another thing. But let's consider a language where things were a little bit different. What if case were not redundant and we bias participants for and against users of case? What if case were doing some important job we bias participants against it? Um, and I think an analogy we can make here with English, which is not about case, but it's about um, different sort of grammatical distinction might be with a form like y'all or think of yous and yins. These um, plural forms of the second person pronoun in English, which allow English speakers to make number distinctions in second person pronouns, which are very useful. Um, but which don't seem to find themselves used very much in higher registers of English. They tend to be deprecated. People tend not to think that these are very good English for using in formal um, circumstances, necessarily. They have a sort of perhaps, you all especially might have a kind of a warm homespun association. So it's not necessarily that the forms are negative, but they're not considered to be very sort of good, formal, proper um, English. So here we have a social bias which is pushing against something which seems to be commutatively functionally useful in English. So let's think, that's the top context to think about this net experiment in. So it's, this is experiment two, um, and it's very, very similar to experiment one, except that this time we have two word orders. We have subject object, word, subject, object verb word order and object subject verb word order. So you can never tell just based on the word order who was the object, who was the subject. We're not provided yet to context to make that any more straightforward. And the aliens use both word orders with equal frequency. But again, the blue species use object case marked 100% of the time. And the orange aliens who kind of looked all smug the last time with a less redundant language, um, now um, all their sentences are kind of, um, there's a lot of media uncertainty um, from them. So overall participants were exposed to 50-50 uh, SOV, OSC, OSV word orders, and 50% of the time they're seeing um, case marking always reliably um, associated with the blue aliens. And we, we had these um, three conditions here. We decided not to replace, not to, re, not to run the um, against um, case condition here simply to save money because it didn't seem to give us anything extra. Last time we were fairly satisfied that it, um, it showed us that what we were manipulating was indeed a social bias. So we didn't feel we needed to run it this time. We also felt that, well, it wasn't clear we needed to run five generations last time. Um, the effect seemed to be fairly clear from the first generation. We thought, well, okay, let's save some more money. Let's um, make this simple one generation learning experiment and see what happens with that. So what are our predictions? Well, we are predict that we should see perhaps less case, so the no case bias condition in line with the earlier experiment, because we have a social bias, which is now pushing a particular direction. So I think, well, even though there are some reasons to retain case of language, in earlier experiments, the anti social bias has shown that when you have this ambiguity, case is retained for longer, we might see that the social bias leads to it um, declining in use even though it contributes to, it contributes to, uh, sorry, it contributes to reducing meaning uncertainty. But because this potentially leads to greater meaning uncertainty, we might see some form of compensation for case loss. That's also a possibility. So what did we find? Well, first of all, we did find less case than no case bias condition. So this is on the y-axis, we have percentage case, and we have the three conditions here, the case condition, the no bias, condition or the case bias condition, the no bias condition, the no case bias condition. So here we have um, case has uh, declined in use down to here when there's a bias against it. So we might expect that this would lead um, to um, greater meaning uncertainty in the sense that participants are producing. But it's also possible that perhaps participants are compensating for 
um, this media uncertainty in some way. So we um, look, measured the average entropy of languages. We looked at the media, looked at the media uncertainty in these um, the census participants producing the average um, uncertainty over the uh, all the censuses they were producing. And we found that um, while we did not have we had we did not have high levels of uncertainty in the case bias condition, no bias condition, we did not see evidence of compensation for the loss of case in the no case bias condition. So that's interesting. And kind of kind of cool. I mean, I think this is and there's a nice analogy to be made with things like the Yol, Yus, Yin's. Um, example from English, but we might also worry, well, okay, this is a sort of one shot um, artificial language learning experiment. That's not a trivial thing to ask participants to do. So it could be that um, what's happening is just the participants have not got their head around the heads around the language properly, that they with more training, more experience, more time to get used to the language, they might have more space to perhaps uh, compensate for um, what's happening in their language. So we replicated this experiment over three days. So this time, um, and these are all online experiments, by the way. So we had a one, um, over three days, we had one session per day where we trained them on language the first day, the next day we trained them on language. Another session on the third day, we uh, trained them again, and then we give them that production test. At the end, we looked at data from that. And we just replicated um, the no case bias um, condition only. So let's see what happened here. So this is um, here, you see a percentage case on the y-axis. And you can see the first three conditions you've seen before. And now we have this new condition. This is a longer no case bias um, condition. And we see very similar results to what we saw before. Uh, we see this loss of um, case again in that condition. But what about compensation? Are participants in this longer experiment compensating for the loss of case? And there are a couple of different ways um, they might do this. And it turns out that, yes, actually things are a little bit different. We do have a significant difference here um, with the, uh, in the um, uncertainty. So for this condition, again, the right, we are seeing what looks like a reduction in the average uncertainty. So participants apparently are doing something to compensate for the loss of case, but what might they be doing? And there are a couple of potential options. One option might be that they're fixing the word order. Perhaps they're using um, SOV word order more than they use the OSV word order. So we can um, look at that. And actually, interestingly, we see that for both it's about the first time we ran it in the second time. It does kind of look as if the percentage, this is the percentage SOV here, is a little bit higher. This is not significant, however. So we're not seeing a significant difference, but it does sort of look eyeball as if there might be something going on, but it's not significant. So what else might they be doing? Well, another possibility might be that they're actually conditioning case on word order, something I mentioned earlier. It could be that, well, they don't use case perhaps with SOV, but when they have the OSV word order, perhaps that seems more marked, then you get some more case use. And that would work to um, reduce this media uncertainty. And we can look at this. We have percentage case on the y-axis here, and we divide up the data based on the word order, OSV on the top, SOV on the bottom. And it does kind of look again as if there might be a difference, except that actually, um, again, we didn't not find a significant um, difference here. So what seems to be happening is that we're getting perhaps very slight, subtle shifts in word order, the condition of case on word order, but these are not perhaps our experiment underpowered. We're not we're not seeing um, we're not finding significant results here. But we are when we take the um, uncertainty measure, the average entropy measure, we're seeing a significant difference um, then. So to include this experiment, we found a social bias would lead people to even drop, to even to drop informative case, case that was doing, uh, playing a role in distinguishing between different possible meanings in this language. And this of course um, saves a certain amount of effort 
participants. In fact, second experiment, um, that's what we're, we're typing. The first experiment, they were clicking on buttons um, for different words. This time they, sort of, they typed their sentences. Um, and it does seem to be that this effort manipulation, um, it seems from earlier experiments, does seem to matter. Um, typing, pressing buttons doesn't matter so much, but when you make participants spend more effort, in fact, I should say, on producing case, it seems to matter, made a difference. And this led to greater media uncertainty. And we saw perhaps some compensation for case loss, but only after longer exposure and only somewhat um, subtly. Now, there are some obvious next steps from this experiment. Um, one possibility is to um, iterate it. Um, so as with the first experiment, we could iterate it and see whether we get um, over the generation, we find that what biases there are in the first generation get amplified over generations. Also, you might well be thinking, this is a, a fair point, that participants are not actually producing sentences for an audience. They're not actually trying to use this language to communicate. And that might matter. It's interesting that we are seeing the kind of effect we're seeing, um, participants just producing sentences, but it might be that these be boosted by actually having an address C. And this is also something that we are currently um, working on. But um, it's kind of annoying to right now in the middle of pandemic to try and run interactive experiments. I've run interactive experiments online and um, you lose even more participants in my experience than you lose um, when you try and bring them into a physical lab, um, depending on how exactly how you want to do it, there are sort of ways around the I guess. Um, and this would mean adjusting the software more. So while we work on this, um, we um, conducted an experiment with some proxies for um, interactions. We we're kind of interested to see what would happen if we just kind of nudge the sense of being of having an audience a little bit. So. We conducted a follow-up experiment to this, um, not actually involving um, social bias in this case. This is just trying things out with, if you like, just the no bias um, condition without any aliens, in fact. So um, not, no pictures of aliens on the videos. So here we had a condition which we'll call the delayed address C condition, where we said, well, the sentences you produce will be shown to another participant later. And we said that that participant would have to pick which video is being referred to, and in fact, you, you the participant, will also have to do the same thing for another participant in a moment. And that if um, the other participant selects the correct video over 90% of the time, you'll get a reward. So we're actually kind of motivating participants to think of having an address C. We um, also had a control condition, no address C condition, where we just said the sentences you produce be recorded. Um, and here we just said we give it a reward for over 90% correct words if your language if your sentences use words actually in the language, um, great. And then as a third possibility, we had the imaginary address C condition where we had a face, this is the face down here, call her Leah. So the sentences you produce will be recorded. Producing them, imagine you're producing them for Leah here. And again, we had this reward for 90% um, correct words. Leah, of course, is not actually picking a video. Um, and this to be clear, as I said, there was no social bias in this um, experiment, and perhaps there should have been, I think it might, might be rather interesting, and this is something I think to do in the future. Uh, um, and everyone actually got the reward. Um, we lied, there was no delayed address C. Um, participants did not have to actually make judgments at the end of the experiment, we said, surprise, actually you're just going to get the reward. So, that's what we did. And what did we find? Well, first of all, we found no difference in uh, case use between the different um, conditions. And we found no difference in word order between the um, different conditions. We found um, basically everything was very, very similar between these um, different conditions. Um, looking at my cat, it wanted to get in. Um, so what about conditioning of case on word order? Well, we looked at that and it sort of does look for the, the green um, um, violins here. There actually does sort of look that there might be a difference and there is a significant difference between for this condition between the different word orders. So fine, um, perhaps, 
sort of interesting, but I think we should probably take this as a pinch of salt, um, given everything else is the same. And in fact, the level of uncertainty in the resulting number is also the same. We did not see a significant difference here. So basically we found kind of a wash. We found everything the same between um, these three um, conditions. In particular, having no adversity and just saying we'd recalled the senses did not, um, was just like the conditions basically where we pretended there was a partner in some form. So um, moving forward, I think the obvious place to go apart from iterating this is to have actual um, human partners. And this is something we're now sort of working towards. Um, or perhaps as an alternative as well to have um, artificial um, partners where we kind of not just pretend, we pretend you have a partner, but we have the um, server respond in particular ways um, in real time. There's a good um, online alternative that doesn't have quite the headaches that recruiting um, people to take part at the same time does. Um, so my overall conclusions. So I think social biases seem to create a new niche for grammatical forms. And we see sort of everyday linguistic examples of this. Um, and we seem to have found um, quite clear evidence of this in the experiments we conducted. These social biases, in other words, seem to modulate the effects of the other pressures acting on the languages. And in some cases, the detriment of communications, really, they end up producing sentences which seem less fit for communicating uh, um, propositions reliably. We did see some compensation for this given time. And possibly, we might tentatively say that perhaps different um, types of bias might operate on different timelines that we have to add the important caveat of, well, at least as we operationalized them. Um, and I think one way of thinking about this is that social factors may be important for answering, well, why this and not that question. So if we, there are different ways, right, that um, languages, speakers can solve, um, can um, solve the problems faced by them different um, arrangements of case word order and other things that participants can bring to bear to um, do the kind of jobs they want language to do. And it may be that part of the story, and almost I think almost certainly is part of the story behind, well, why we see different solutions in different places is to some extent due to um, social factors operating in different times. Not the only thing, but I think um, does matter. And it's, I think, nice to be able to um, show this experimentally in these artificial language experiments. Um, so I'll finish by saying thanks to a number of people. I won't mention Masha again, though obviously thanks to Masha who um, is involved in all these studies. Um, also thanks to Lucy Hall Hartley um, in Arizona, who's a grad student working with Masha Fitzgina. Thanks to Aja Altenhoff, who's an undergraduate student um, working with me um, at Penn. Um, she actually, some of you may have met her, she actually um, came to Edinburgh for a semester abroad um, last spring and then the pandemic hit, so she quite possibly didn't get a chance to meet. A lot of you, but um, I think uh, we'll all be hearing more from her in the future because she's um, she's very smart. Um, and thanks again to, to some other people who did not provide photos: Andrew Watts, um, to Arizona, Alicia Cooper, and Vanessa Nieto, and many other members of my lab at Penn. And also thank you to the Penn University Research Fund. And thank you to you. Thank you, Gareth. It was. Great, it was super interesting and awesome. Thank you. So now I think the normal procedure is to ask for the first question to be from a student. And to do that, normally we give people like a minute to gather their thoughts together and come up with a question. So once you're ready to do that, if you, I, I guess you can either raise your hand with the raisey hand reaction thing or type hand in the chat box. And if you're a student, it'd be helpful um, if you type hand bracket student or something like that. Will you, you'll select, uh, you'll select questions, right? I'll, I'll do that. So, yeah. Right. And I, I guess in general, I'm going to prioritize student questions. Sure. Um, and in the meantime, how's the weather in, in Philly? It's actually very nice. It's uh, it's not incredibly. It was well. Well, I went out for a walk this morning. It was about six degrees, but it's uh, it's really sunny. Maybe a nice week. It's, I think it's uh, it's actually going to be quite warm um, the rest of the week. It's been 
sort of getting up towards 20, which is... All right. <laughs> Why on earth did I let a cat in? Yeah, uh, <laughs> the problem, it's a choice. For Every time I've done that, it's been a disaster you know, on, the, <laughs> on, the, on the keyboard or on the camera. So she's she's actually got better. We, I mean, part of the problem is that her food is in the study here with me. Um, and it was a problem. Now have a nice chair. So we moved the chair up from the living room when we swapped some furniture around behind me. So she actually comes up and sits on the chair now. So it's not too bad. It's preferable to let her in than have a scratch on the door, which is um, it becomes increasingly annoying. Okay, so I'm, now, I think. I'm not seeing any hands at all. So like, can I would apart from Kenny's cat question, can I I can go for an, a more open question? I'm open to questions on other animals. Okay. <laughs> Should we just go for Jenny? Sure. Hi, Hi Jenny. Eric. Thanks very much. Nice to see you. Um, I see you too. It's really cool to see um, how how this work is is evolving. No pun intended. Um, so, I mean, I'm not a sociolinguist, but I was wondering just a bit about the like the social bias aspect of this. I mean, have you have you thought a bit about just I don't know, just like different different kinds of ways to make this social yeah. bias a little bit stronger for people, or a little bit more. Yeah, I'm just I'm just wondering if you've thought about that. Other options for. Yeah, uh, very good question. Um, I mean, I'm also not a social linguist, but I hang out with social linguists uh, fairly often. Um, and we've done. I mean, I've done other experiments where we've introduced social biases in slightly different ways. I guess where sometimes more sort of distributionally. You know, we we sort of give it in subtler ways. Let's say, and I I also kind of like the idea of. Um, so we we you do things like so I did an experiment right where we um we talked about toughness and things like that and we had we made the you know kind of pictures of the aliens looking really tough and we introduced made toughness re relevant in the game and stuff like that so it's kind of fun things you can do like that where you infuse the game in different ways with this kind of bias um yeah I I would like I, th I think there's always this tension right between making the experiment more complicated in that respect and having something a bit more realistic and interesting and also having an experiment which is nice and simple where you know that your social bias comes from one place it's the instructions it's just sentence in the instructions where we're saying you know these people are cool do you like these um i mean i think and it's tricky i mean if you want to do a sort of more let's say realistic social bias well ideally you kind of bring the participants up on the planet and you introduce them to the different you know there are lots of there's some more complicated ways you do that where you immerse participants more in different ways and i think that's that also that ends up adding more time things but yeah this is something i'm, I'm interested I, i'm quite interested in, is, is trying to make the social bias more interesting i don't i don't know about stronger i think perhaps it's yeah. unlikely yeah, to be right. it's already fairly strong i guess but um i think it would be yeah nice moving forward with this paradigm to try and play around with different ways of doing that obviously yeah. starting off with this kind of sorry yeah i mean i was kind of wondering i mean i don't I know that some there's been at least one project in the CLE that's involved like in group out group things. So maybe Kenny can talk more about that. But um, yeah. no, I'm absolutely. Yeah. You could incorporate that into like if you end up doing an interaction version of the experiment, maybe there's a way to sort of incorporate that. Um, a long time ago, I did an in group out group experiment in, in what was then the <laughs> LEC. Um, uh, but there's there's yeah there's also the minimal group paradigm time manipulation, which is I think is a really good way of um, approaching that. But again, it takes a bit more time to um, a little bit more time to set up. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. And we've got a question now from Ashlyn. Ashlyn. Hello. Um, that was really cool. Thanks. Thank um, I was just wondering on the so on actually on the same point of um, ways to manipulate the social bias bias. If you have a communicative task, could you do something like um, like make that bias originate with the interlocutor, like your partner doesn't trust orange aliens or something like that? Yeah, no, I think that's a really good idea. And I think one of the things, um, so I mean, the next step with it, actually making this commutative is going to simply be, well, you actually have someone you're talking to, which I think matters quite a lot. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, the next step is, well, there's a lot you can do with this, right? You can make your partner an orange alien, you make your partner a blue alien, make your partner a yellow alien or a red alien or some other um, different colour. And then you can play around with, well, okay, this alien is of this sort and they have this attitude and there's so a, yeah, there's a, there's a really good idea and there's a, there's a whole bunch of um, really cool stuff that could be um, done with that. 
Um, yeah, absolutely. And we found, I mean, early work I've done, I've had commutative experiments where you are interacting with aliens of different kinds and actually the, you, know, you have a real human person on the other end and you're actually interacting with them. Um, a couple of different, we've also played as far as we, we kind of have real interaction where, as I worked with Lacey Wade, which um, was published last year, which I encourage people to look at. Um, she's also really, involved. she's a real social linguist. Um, and we had um, interactions in artificial language where we varied what alien this, their interact, uh, interacting participant actually was and played around with that and what they produced and so on. So um, that, yeah, there's real scope for doing that. Okay, and uh, a non-cat related question from Kenny. I actually got, oh. actually got a couple of questions, neither of them are about cats, but it, um, Jenny and I have done some um, communication stuff with um, case marking and you get you get a pretty reliable boost for case mm -hmm. marking if, if it's ab absence results in ambiguity. So that like that all, that should work for- Yeah, case. I'm hoping. Yeah, and so the, the, the first question was, um, do you think there's something special about the social cue in, in, in these kinds of paradigms, or could you could you just boost could you could you just boost some, like some random thing like don't mess up the description for events? Yeah, object, yeah. object X. It's a very good, very good question. I so I think I think there are different ways you can boost this. Right. Let's start by saying that. So I don't think this is the only theory to find which is going to boost or modulate this. I do. On the other hand, think based on other work that social biases work in particular ways and certain things matter in the context of social biases which don't necessarily matter elsewhere. So for example, there's a work I did with um, Betsy where we had part of, we had this sort of toughness manipulation. We associated a linguistic form of toughness or with particular sort of alien. And we found a difference depending on whether we associated with a feature of the alien or with the aliens. And we found it mattered whether or not toughness mattered. So in an experiment where toughness was a part of the participants inhabited, they had fights, that made a difference. So I think that these things do matter. So it's not, they're not interchangeable, but I don't, I don't think this is the only way we would find a bias of modi. I think we could probably, um, we probably could tell participants pay a lot more attention to these aliens to these aliens without making it negative um, and think uh, something along those lines we probably would find some effect from that i think as well that um having to focus on case perhaps making or one way i've thought about this is you sort of introduce a kind of prescriptive bias if you like you say your case is video um which is semi-social i guess um we could we'd probably find some kind of boost although i Seem to recall being told of someone who did an experiment, some an experiment that kind of did that and did not find the same kind of level of um, effect. By I'm forgetting now who that was. Cool. Um, can I quickly like, have a quick other question? Was you see in experiment two how you 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 ran a three day version mm -hmm. in, in, in the hope that that would that that would produce the effect you were after? Why would you? Why would you? Why would getting more training on the target language lead to people to depart further from it? That seems like what we well, not departing further from it exactly. I think the idea was that so the concern we had was that, and this goes back to some other work that Mash has done, and she's found that you see certain effects tend to occur after longer training, part of where participants, if you like, get a bit more used to how the language works and a bit more comfortable with the language. That's how I th I'd like to think about it. That at first, they're just kind of, oh, yeah, you know, they're trying. after one session, it's perhaps a somewhat difficult task. Participants seem to have some trouble getting their head around some participants, what case is even, or what this little marker is doing. Um, so we, she's found, and we found, that it does seem to make a difference if you have participants get more training, they become a little, let's say, a little more comfortable with the language um, and seem to have more headspace available for um, thinking about the commutative task, let's say. They're not for, no longer just focusing on trying to remember how the language works. They're now sort of thinking perhaps about the production task a little bit more. That's a way of um, thinking about it, at least how I think about it. But it'd be interesting to figure it, to try and get at exactly what's going on there in more detail. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cool. Okay. I've got a question from Michael Player now. Hi, Michael. Yeah. Uh, not nice. Not nice talk, thanks. And I, I, I hope Jenny hasn't asked this question because I heard her say something about in-group, out-group, and then my doorbell rang. So <laughs> <laughs> apologies if, if that has been asked before. But I was just wondering, so 
regarding the in-group bank group so in this kind of setup like the the participants are outsiders right um yeah exactly that's a good point in the sense they are inherently outsiders they're sort of moving in and, but there's if you like they're trying to get it in mm -hmm. so so there, there's some kind of interesting kind of things where it's about pretending to be part of the group so for example like you're you're pretending to be an orange alien or you pre are pretending to be a green alien or whatever uh and i was wondering if that you know what you would expect in that kind of, yeah. kind of setup and how it would uh kind of influence things that's a good question actually and i think i mean going back i guess to jenny's question that might be a way of doing that probably would be a way of getting a kind of a stronger um social effect um where you're not just you 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 you're not just trying to get to aliens you are actually so among of the you are belonging you actually belong to that group yeah that would be that would make a lot of sense i mean it's a, it's a definite way to go um i don't know for sure that we would necessarily find a different effect but i would expect the effect to go in a very similar um kind of direction so i expect it to be quite a similar um effect possibly a little bit stronger right That's a good point. okay um, and Simon. So. Hi, hi, Gareth. Um, I kind of hesitated to ask this question because it's a, a little bit half formed in my head, but I kind of wanted to get you to, um, I don't know, expand on how your work fits within a sort of broader cosmology of language evolution research. Ah. So, so what we tend to do is think about how biases that come from various um, directions impact on the structure of language. So, for example, we would have um, biases that favour being informative, impacting on on the evolution of the system. And so, you have some of that in in your experiment too, obviously. And I was just kind of, I'm kind of left wondering what you, how you think consideration of these social biases should modulate our kind of approach to that. I mean, do you think that this kind of the fact that you have these social biases should should be a problem for theories that talk about, for example, this optimal trade off between learnability and expressivity that we're always going on about these days or or not? And if not, then where does this work sit within that kind of yeah. frame? That's a good I mean, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I think it is so. I mean, there are different ways of approaching that question. I'll try, and I may. This is my answers are going to be a little bit half formed as well. So as I try to um, think the best way to put it, I mean, one one thing to say is I think one thing I'd like to see, speaking on a rather meta level, I, I think I, I like I would like very much to see more um, interaction, more um, better relationships between sort of social linguistics and language evolution, and more conversation more sort of incorporation of the kind of uh, social indesicality for instance among other the many other things that you know social linguists um care about um in this kind of work so there's that side to things um more theoretically i think that um i mean there were different i mean to some extent what i see myself as doing with some of these experiments is talking about is looking at not necessarily the question of I mean, I started looking at the sort of larger typology of, you know, of how do we get from what people do in actual interactions to get to how, why languages are the way they are. And I sort of finished with some, you know, an indication of a sort of rather vague point about, well, some, sometimes we wonder, kind of attuation problem, well, why did this happen here and not here? Why did this happen and not this? Why not? And I think getting at that kind of relatively small scale um, question, we get an answer here from saying, well, or a potential answer here, that, well, part of this is that this is not happening in a social vacuum, that people care about other things apart from just these factors. One thing to add, I mean, one other point to mention, of course, is, you know, the effect, we're talking about social factors of modulating these other effects is not the case. Even in the first experiment that we saw, the case marker was like, use a lot, use all the time. We found it declined over time, it would probably disappear. We'd probably find whom will one day disappear from English. So given enough time, maybe we shouldn't, it's not really a problem in a sense, given enough time, if that's generally what we should expect to see, 
well, it's not going to make much difference, which we're really explaining ripples in a more in a longer to long term trend, if that's you know, generally what we should um, expect to see based on this experiment. But I think we want to do these experiments to find out what kind of what role social factors play. And I also wouldn't want to suggest that this is always what we're going to see. I mean, I think this is what happens when we pit these particular pressures against each other, where we put these particular pressures into the mix. But under other circumstances, um, where we don't have this kind of competition between these particular pressures and the um, social pressures, I think we might find social pressures playing some other um, role. Obviously, um, I mean, there's other, you know, I've done other words um, along those lines, but it, well, why do we end up with languages split with new dialects forming? Why do we end up with Asian emerging? Why do we end up with these different things? So I think in that respect, it, it plays a part. But does that, does that answer your question? It's all a, a little bit half formed. There's a lot of different, um, um, a lot of different um, things on the same question, but hopefully that was helpful. Okay, um, Lauren Hall Liu is on record as agreeing with you, Gareth, about the importance of <laughs> sociolinguistics. And I think that's all Lauren Hall had, so a lot of people agree. Um, and I'm not sure if Alexandru is a student. So Lauren definitely is a student. So I'm going to go with Lauren first, and then Alexandru, whatever his status, can go next. Uh, hi. Um, so I have a couple of questions that kind of go together. So, so first of all, um, obviously, we know that people uh, entrain to the language use of their, their partners, um, but that that is usually like kind of a fleeting effect. So, I mean, I was wondering if um, I, I was just wondering if, if we then ask them to produce again a few days later, whether we still see the effect of the social bias. Um, but also whether um, you could actually manipulate the bias by, you know, first of all, training them in a way to enforce one bias, but then flipping around and asking uh -huh. them to produce sentences that actually uh, relate to the other bias, um, kind of, you know, playing with that entrainment idea. So that's, a, that's an interesting idea where you have participants sort of, um, yeah, I mean, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm going to recommend this paper I came out last year with Lacey Wade again, where we had participants learn a language. And this was kind of um, really about accommodation. So this was based, she's interested and she looked at this natural language um, on um, people's expectations of accommodation, right? As opposed to what they actually observe. Um, so you have this relationship between people adapting to the person they imagine they're talking to, but they're actually talking to, and that kind of um, effect. And we, you know, we changed who people thought they were talking to based on that work. Based on that work, um, I would expect to see we would see a shift in what participants did. So if they were sort of talking to different aliens, let's say. We would see a shift, but I think that we would likely see order effects, depending on exactly how we did this. So what we found, Lacey and I found was, um, it would depend on how we set up the bias, of course, how much they were taught to like this alien, not like this alien, and so on. Um, we So what we found was where participants' expectations were um, consistent with observation, we sort of found this boost effect, and then later when their sort of expectations were changed, where they suddenly found they were talking to someone they didn't expect or who use the language away didn't we found this sort of dampening effect and then we didn't find that the um, original effect sort of carried on the same level after we didn't find the same sort of level of accommodation later whereas if we sort of ordered things a little bit differently we found this sort of boost, boosting effect which continued which persisted over a longer period so um, anyway that's a very vague not maybe not very clear explanation of a study I haven't talked about um, today but based on that I think that's the sort of thing we'd affect we, we, we'd find we'd um, if we had this talking to different aliens and diff or we, we would find that that would have some kind of effect. Does that answer your question? I'm not, sorry, it wasn't a very clear answer. I know, that's great. Thank you. Okay, and um, now to Alexandra. Thank Alexandra. you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I wanted to ask that um, before we have this social bias towards one variation or one instance of variation, we should already have some variation, right? So would those social factors then be secondary in terms of, you know, order of uh, applying? Uh, so, you know, th there has to be already something different and mm -hmm. this diversification is produced by some different factors. So you think there's still some place for um, social factors in the first place? Um, so kind of you're asking where, where does variation come from? 
right? Is that yeah, probably more generally, yes. So basically, it's kind of, yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I think it's a very good question. I mean, there were, and there are, I mean, I think there are different sources of variation, right? So, um, to some extent, right, you're going to find in a community that, well, changes happen in this place, but there's not as much communication between these people and these people. So these people end up going a slightly different direction by chance. The changes which happen in this place doesn't spread to this owing to um, variation in interaction um, over time. And then you, but social factors are going to matter as well, right? So, I mean, social factors are going to be involved in who you interact with, whether or not you interact with these people, whether or not you care about what they're doing, whether you're influenced by them as much and so on. So I think a lot of this, it, there's a number of things going on and you're going to find variation occurring for, um, you know, non, for a variety of uh, uh, reasons. I mean, this, where the all sorts of um, changes to occur at an individual level, some of which will not be picked up, will not spread beyond the individual, will not spread beyond the immediate um, circle. Um, but then I think what matters is there's obviously going to be social factors another, not necessarily connected with social identity, about just get picked up and how they spread um, it's quite, yeah. Uh, so I, th I think it, it's a good question. I think we have to sort of imagine this, this experiment, well, so already happened, sure. So we have these dialects and yes, fine. There's gonna be some um, stuff has happened in the past. I mean, there's some earlier work I did back, back when I was a PhD student in Edinburgh, which is sort of looking at the emergence of new um, dialects uh, where we started with a homogeneous language and we introduced this um, kind of in-group, out-group um, distinction and found um, that the language broke up into dialects, partly by um, th through this sort of social um, influence on randomly occurring um, variations of so typos, people misremembering words, things like that. Um, and then some of that got carried away and formed into dialects. Um, so I think that's, that may get to your question to some extent. So that's in your PhD, you said, right? Yeah, that was uh, PhD. It's a 20, the 2010 paper you can read, which is on my webpage if you're interested. Yep, thank you. Okay, and we have oodles of time for a question from Tom. No. You don't want to give me oodles of time. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, thank you, Gareth, for the talk. Um, I was also, like Simon, a bit uh, unsure about asking a question because it's half formed, and I suspect it's the other half of Simon's question. <laughs> going in a similar direction. So feel free to say, see my earlier answer. Um, so I suppose in a simple form, the question is who would disagree? And maybe no one, and maybe that's fine. So if I understand right, you're saying, look, in the factors that are acting on languages as they evolve are not simply communication in some very narrow sense of the word of information transfer, Shannon reduction of uncertainty, but they're multiple and varied and we, we you know, we're expressing identity and doing all sorts of other things, that, as you rightly say, sociolinguists study in much more detail than language evolutionists. Does anyone disagree? And maybe not, and maybe that's okay, like I say, but I just, I'm just trying to understand the, the science no, of the cosmology. So I think the point here is um, I'm not trying to say, well, lots of people don't think social factors matter at all. Um, Yes, they do. The point is, well, okay, we all agree that um, social indexicality is a thing. We all agree that these the factors, the other factors we've talked about seem to sort of influence language in particular ways. Um, but we don't, I think, tend to incorporate the social factors in this film. We don't tend to look at, well, how do they affect these things? How do they interact with these things? What happens? How does this, ha how does this affect? Do we find, in fact, that um, so saying to the first experiment, the simple example, would we, do we find that once you have the social factor coming in, we keep the case, suddenly the case market is just kept? Well, no, not entirely. It, actually, the, the trend is modulated. Um, it declines over time, but it's not kept 100% of the time. So how do these things interact? What's the role of social factors um, here? And another way, I mean, another way of looking at what I'm doing in this kind of experiment, if you like, is, well, I think it's interesting to try and answer. So if you're, you, some people are interested in the kind of language evolution questions of where do we get these structures from? Um, why do the experiments? So you can see my experiments in those terms as well, I'm bringing these social factors in to look at how these interact with those other factors we've talked about. 
But another way of looking at it is, well, I'm interested in using this kind of experiment experiment to ask social linguistic questions. So look at the role of social mm -hmm. factors. And I'm, it's a, as a work on where does indebtedness come from? Um, where do new dialects come from? How what happens um, where what happens in accommodation? What's the relationship between observation and expectation? What's the uh, role of um, social indebtedness in the um, in the retention of certain forms like whom things like that so there's a there's a but so it depends to some extent on what question you think i'm trying to answer and i framed it in a particular way here but i could have framed it in a slightly different way so i'm not trying to say that well lots of people don't think social factors matter actually they do it's that's a bit i think that's a bit too simplistic i mean there might be someone who thinks that but hopefully not so i think unless Oh, we got a quick, we have a, a, a question from Kurt Erbach, but he can't turn his mic on. So, okay, there we go. I can read it. Sure. So, to what extent could social factors affect learning across different linguistic categories, if any? I think so. I guess that's pretty right. Um, well, um, so do we think that there's going to be it, so I suppose if I understand the question right, yeah, it's um, is this you know is this special to cases? Is this are there other sort of categories going to be affected differently? Is this he, he's clarified something yeah, other yeah. than case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think yeah, that's a good question, and it would be interesting to look at. I think so. I think maybe a way of putting this question to say, well, in the experiment I talked about we have some very clear we have a very clear role for case in the second experiment we have a very clear sense about what case is doing in the two experiments right we have word order is we have this relationship between word order and case here um in for other linguistic categories we might not find that right so we might not find that there's this the case that whatever linguistic category we happen to be thinking about past tense forms let's say this is necessarily doing quite the same thing that they're um, there might be alternative, other alternative, uh, past tense forms is a bad example, but I'm just on top of my head of a thing that we might be interested in. Um, so there's a whole bunch of, I suppose what I'm saying is, there's a number of different ways in which different linguistic categories might relate to the commutative um, roles and biases that might be at play here. So case and word order were set up in the experiment to have a particular relationship with each other. And I think that's probably what we should maybe care about the most and that we might find if they didn't have that kind of the same sort of disambiguation role and same relationship with each other we would not necessarily find social factors affecting them in quite the same um, way the other point to raise would be about the salience and the extent to which these are um, learnable um, and that also matters so we certainly we find as a kind of um, experimental problem um, certain types of things are going to be harder for participants um, to learn and this is likely to have an effect. And we also should also, I think, care about salience. So is this something participants are even going to notice um, as variation in language? So there's a number of ways they vary, but I don't necessarily think it's about the kind of linguistic category per se, so much as the salience of what we're talking about and its relationship with other um, categories and what um, we might want to do with the language. Kurt says, thank you. Okay. Um, I think that's us through the questions. So if, if there aren't any more, I think we should all say thank you to Gareth. So thank you all. Thank you all.